right, so uh, thanks everyone for joining us for today's Government Affairs Committee meeting. Uh, appreciate everybody uh, spending some time with us today. Uh, we'll just go ahead and uh, go ahead and introduce our speaker. Uh, today we have a great speaker. David is going to give us a brief introduction. Um, our, uh, our speaker today, who was uh, kind enough to join us and, and, and educate us, is uh, Miss Kim Harrison. And uh, she is with the uh, Arkansas Community Foundation. A um, little bit more about her. She was a program manager for a Department of Defense contractor. Uh, she's also been the owner of a landscape design and maintenance firm. She moved to the village from St. Louis in 2001, so she's been with us a while. Uh, she has been involved in golf, uh, in bridge, and uh, has been active in the computer club. Uh, and active in the Hot Springs and Hot Springs Village uh, Parkinson Disease uh, Support Group. Uh, she was uh, president of the Arkansas chapter of the American Parkinson Disease Association for five years. Uh, she was congregation and board president for the uh, uh, Unitarian uh, Village Church and uh, she joined the Hot Springs Village affiliate of the Arkansas Community Foundation in uh, 2017. And uh, that has been her uh, passion recently and why she is with us today. So, uh, Ms. Harrison. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay, okay. Are we ready to share a screen? Hi, Bob. Hey, Kim, how are you? I'm good. Good. Okay, today we're going to talk about grade level reading and why it is so important to have proficiency by the third grade and what we can do in our communities to try and improve it because Arkansas is not doing so well. Um, about four years ago or so, we partnered with the Arkansas Campaign for Grade Level Reading, which was an agency that the governor's office started about four or five years ago to investigate why Arkansas is so far behind in proficiency in reading and what steps we may be able to take to improve that. So we partnered with them to basically give out grants for uh, programs that look like they are going to improve grade level reading. Why does it really matter? Well, it turns out if you're not proficient at reading by grade three, you fall further and further behind your whole student life. By grade three, you stop learning how to read and start reading to learn other matter. So if you're not proficient by then, you can't learn anything else and you just get further and further and further behind. Students who are proficient by grade three have a 96% graduation rate, which is outstanding compared to those who are not proficient. And if we cut our dropout rate in half, it will add $43 million to our economy in the state. Where do we stand right now? And these are 19 figures since the tests weren't given in 20 because of COVID. 38% um, statewide of our students are reading proficiently at third grade level. That's an improvement. Three years ago, it was 35%. So we're going in the right direction. Now, some of the local school districts are ahead of that. Uh, some of the others are a little behind that. 
but all of them overall have improved at least two or three percentage points. So we are making strides. And how can we move the numbers more? Well, originally, uh, they thought that these five areas were the most important to achieve grade level reading. Since this program started, the Arkansas Campaign for Grade Level Reading has found more information that they need to take a more holistic approach and they have rebranded themselves to Excel by eight. And what they have found out is on top of this, why are kids chronically absent? <clears throat> Food insecurity, lack of health care, the whole social in infrastructure ties in to all of these issues. So they need to take the whole community and incorporate it into a whole program to help grade level reading. School readiness. They have scientifically they have found out that by the age of three, eighty five percent of the brain has been formed, and its functioning has been formed. So those first couple of months and the first two years are the most important in a child's life to be able to succeed. It's not what they do in school. It's what they get in the first couple of years. <clears throat> By age three, you can see from those numbers that kids in professional households know oh, more than twice as many words as kids in the poor areas. And why is that? Well, in middle, middle income families, the ratio of books per child is 13. In poor areas, 300 children per book, which means that you could take a whole Mountain Pine school district and there's probably two books in that whole school district because they have about 600 kids. Chronic absence is another issue. Now you might think, did I skip a slide? Nope, okay. Um, if you're chronically absent, that means you miss more than one day per month, uh, one month per year of school. And if you miss out, you can't learn. So that affects grade level reading. What's shocking is that with brain development now known to be such an early issue in a child's life, a lot of parents think, oh, it's just kindergarten if the kid doesn't feel good or if, you know, their shoes, clothes aren't clean or something, we won't send them to school. That's when they really need to be in school because you miss a day of kindergarten and you miss that much in helping your brain develop. So chronic absence in the early years is the most important. Then there's summer learning loss. Now we all know that happens, but the difference between low income students and middle income students is tremendous. By the fifth grade, they're almost three years behind, which means they're still stuck in the second grade and their ability to read. Summer learning programs. In this area, there aren't any. There's summer school for the kids who are flunking and have to take remedial classes, but there's nothing to prevent summer loss or to engage the kids to learn further. Nothing in this area, and only 17% of the kids in Arkansas have a quality summer program. Family and community issues. They have found out that if there's a strong tie between the schools and the community, the kids do a lot better. 
math is better by 10 times, reading by four times, and attendance is higher because the community cares about the school. Now, one of the things before I go any further, I, I'd like to talk about is this holistic approach that the Excel by Eight program is starting to use. One of the initiatives they're taking is creating community schools. Now, it's not a new charter school, it's not a new school. It's just turning existing public schools into community hubs. And what they're doing, uh, they're, they've done this in Magnolia, they started with three schools in Little Rock, and I believe Batesville is the furthest along. They have a community coordinator in one of the schools, and they partner with the local hospital, the local social agencies, uh, DHS, to provide services at the school for the community that school is in. So not only students get nursing care with the school nurse, but their parents are the grandma who lives down the street. Anybody in that community can use the services at the school. That makes everyone invested in the school and they understand what's going on in the school and they are more supportive of the school. So that is being done now in Arkansas, one school at a time. I believe it's Arizona has done this pretty extensively and has had very good results. So we're going to get that again. Who are you? Arizona. Arizona, Arizona, I believe. Um, so some of the local programs that the Hot Springs Village Community Foundation has uh, granted to to help support grade level reading is the Dolly Part Imagination Libraries of both the Washita's and Saline counties. And that gets books into the hands of children from birth to age five. So by the time they're five years old, they have 60 books instead of 300 kids per one book. So we've supported that for several years now. Uh, we also just recently gave a grant to Science Huts at Mid America Science Museum. And that program is for preschoolers. And they, um, the parents are the caregivers of the preschooler take them to the Science Museum and they have a story time based on science with scientific books that are written for children that age. And then they do hands-on experiments that, ex that kind of explains and lets them do the things that are explained in the book. So we've supported that and we gave a grant to Altrusa this year for dictionaries for third graders at the local school. So those are some of the things we as a community, local community foundation are doing. Um, and the funds that we grant out are then matched by the Arkansas Community Foundation has a, has a fund set up just for grade level reading and they match any grade level reading grant that we give out, they will match dollar for dollar up to 2,500. Hi. Yes. Um, I belong to Altrusa. Uh huh. And um, I have a question, and that is would it be better to get those dictionaries to the children sooner in like second grade or first grade? First and grade's probably too soon. Um, second grade, maybe. I don't know. You'd probably have to talk to the teachers' schools, schools about that. What's, what's interesting is that for so many of these third graders, um, back to the statistics that you were showing. For so many of them, that's the first book they've ever owned. Yeah. Because each child gets their own dictionary. And, and that's pretty mind-blowing that it takes till the third grade to have a book, any kind of book. Yep. It's, I, I grew up with books, so I can't imagine uh, not having books as a child. I mean, they just let your imagination run and it's wonderful. 
Anyway, um, so some of the things that you as the community, um, governmental affairs committee can do is spread the word. One of the things you can do is bone up, and that's on the next slide, on all the data that's on expire, aspire, A-S-P-I-R-E, Arkansas.org. That is a project that the Community Foundation took on um, oh, about 10 years ago to compile all the data available on health, education, families, and community in one place by county and for education by school district. So if you want to know what the graduation rate is at Jesseville schools, you can look it up on that website and find out. And you can find out if it's improving or getting worse. You can find out the drug usage rate. Uh, you can find out how many people smoke. You can find out how many seniors are, have food insecurity. So that website is a treasure trove of information. What yes. is it again? AspireArkansas.org. A-S-P-I-R-E, Arkansas. Um, so you can do some investigation and that's what we use a lot of times for our granting. So we get the biggest bang for our buck when we give it out to get the biggest need in the area is we'll use the Aspire data. And it is constantly updated. It used to be a printed volume, so it was only updated every five or six years. Now it's online, so it's updated constantly. So if you would like more information. Who, uh, who is, uh, who's gathering all of that data? Who's, who is, uh putting the data in Aspire. The Community Foundation mm -hmm. has contracted with a, a firm, to an aggregation yeah. firm, to do that for us. Okay. <clears throat> so let's see, um, as I said earlier, the campaign for uh, Arkansas Campaign for Grade Level Reading has been rebranded to Excel by Eight. And I suggest you look at their website. They have a lot of good information on grade level reading and other things that affect that. Um, the Aspire Arkansas. And if you want to know anything else about the Village Community Foundation, contact me. Any more questions? Yes. Um, when you say, um, uh, third grade, third grade reading level. Um, which third grade reading level is that? Is that Arkansas? Is that national? Is that international? It's what, it's national. <clears throat> it's the national standard. Yeah, and it's the the Park Aspire exam. It's based on the Park aspire exam that's given every year except for last year um, also on aspirearkansas.org they not only give you the data but they compare it to the nation so you know where we stand against the rest of the country uh, Ken, what are other things that you think that hot springs village could do to assist in this program i, I know that there are a lot of residents here that really don't know there's a lot of kids here but there are a lot of kids here right how how could we potentially work with you to try to help educate and get the community more involved especially with students um well last year just at the wrong time we started um i'm not getting the name of it for the volunteers yeah oh uh, answering the call in yeah. north Maryland county because um, the schools were having troubles coordinating volunteers and volunteers didn't know who to contact mm -hmm. at the schools if they wanted to help. So we started working with the schools to form Answering the Call in North Carolina County, which is kind of a um, database of all the people who want to help. Well, that was just getting started and background checks were being run when COVID hit and the schools mm -hmm. closed. So that kind of went by the wayside for now, but we hope to resurrect it again. 
So there's that. There is um, one of the biggest things in this area is the lack of quality daycare and preschools. Um, there's the one down on Highway 5, but I'm not sure how good it is. There's Great Futures, which is good, but they're still working on getting their preschool set up. Um, and then there's another one in the village, but I really don't know anything about it. So that's one of the problems in Arkansas as a whole, the lack of quality daycare and preschool slots. It's like less than 20% of the number of kids that need it. So that's, that's a big issue. So, you know, trying to organize maybe another daycare. In the is that anything the state is also trying to help resolve? I mean, are they trying to encourage or giving tax incentives? The, or yes, things yes they to... are. There is, um, I can't remember what it's called now, but there is a state rating system for daycare and what it's called, I can't. It's left my mind, but um, that is one of the things that Excel by Eight is looking into. I think none of us can claim expertise in these areas. We've tried and we've tried, and we seem to be hitting the target way at the edges. I just came out of 11 years of teaching seniors in high school, and the only conclusion I could make about reading skills, and I taught English, and these were 18 year olds, and many of them could not take it through a paragraph. Many of them. And, and as you know, the system just keeps moving them along because they don't want dropout rates and everything else that affects funding. I found that it's kind of like giving them a bunch of seeds. And when they get home, there's no soil yeah. at all. So giving people books is a good idea, but if it doesn't get reinforced at home, it falls on deaf ears. We need to educate the parents because these parents are the first generation of bad readers. So they don't know how to do homework with their child. They don't. And it's not a matter of resistance, although they have plenty of reasons to resist with two and three sources of income out of one mother. They have all the reasons in the world to say, I don't have time for homework, but they also don't have the skill. And the toughest part, they don't have the confidence. They're afraid their child might be able to outread them, outmath them, out social studies yeah. them. And it becomes embarrassing to get involved with the homework process. And I don't know how to fix that other than we need books. That is, but we also need an environment in which those books can take hold. That's one of the things that Excel by 8 is trying yeah. home visitation, get um, getting the parents more involved, yes. having tutoring for the parents, having you know social services for the parents. So that's, you, you set up a free meal, they'll come. Yeah. And then they'll learn how to do that homework. That's some of the things that they're starting to. That's great. Looking at it's tough. Yeah. Um, a couple, a couple of just thoughts. I'm not necessarily recommending these things. I'm just throwing them out for people to to co to cogitate on <clears throat> regarding um, the the kids not getting the support at home. Um, one one way to possibly help with that would be to uh, uh, provide uh, at the schools sort of after school uh, continuation where the school stays open mm -hmm. yeah. and has like, a, you know, maybe you have study hall in the basketball gym or something and whoever mm -hmm. wants to stay until up to like six o'clock then that provides the kids a continued environment where they can study. And it would also provide to parents extended daycare, which is what they're, which is what these parents are most interested in. Um, and that would be something for everybody. It would provide the kids a desired environment and it would provide the parents uh, more of the services that they are the most interested in. That's the first comment. Second comment well, about... Let, let's react to that first. It's interesting we feed them breakfast and lunch in many cases, but we don't feed their brains. 
Yeah. But we'll give them cereal and milk. Well, that was one of the things that we were trying to address with answering the call in North Carolina. Yeah, that's right. great. Was after school programs and and mentoring and things like that. But you know, the schools aren't allowing volunteers in at all. At this time. Right. Right. So, but that was one of the things we were trying to do. And that's the other concept behind this community school idea is that the school would be open more hours and have more activities at it to, to provide a better environment. And one other comment, I, um, I really like these uh, community schools in theory, uh, as you just presented them. Uh, the only caveat I would make, and I, I do not know if these community schools are already doing what I am suggesting uh, or, or not, but um, you talked about that the schools are the location for providing a variety of other services, making them uh, a community center and making them a location that the parents would start coming to and that the parents, the parents that we are talking about, uh, would start finding value uh, in coming to the school. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would suggest, and I don't, maybe it's already being done, but I would suggest that, that built into providing these services at the school, that there be some sort of responsibility and accountability like you can come to the school for these things if your child's attendance is is 90 percent you can come to the school for these things if your child is passing so that it's not just free social services yet again but it's the kids who aren't there and the kids who aren't passing that need the most help yeah that's ironic yeah well, you, okay. you know it's 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 kind of like you reward the best treaters. Right. Well, that's not what you should do. You should reward the, the kids who have improved the most. You step it out. I think the challenge we have right now is we don't have Dr. Murphy or Melissa Spears on right now. Because right. I know some of this stuff is being handled right mm -hmm. now. That's good. And we just need to know what is and what isn't. Because then, Bob, you're on, on the line there. You know, the schools bought the Boys and Girls Club out there and what are they still doing out there today? I mean, that's where the, uh, they were sending kids for after school yes. mm -hmm. yeah. to, out to the Boys and Girls Club. They still do. So I think that's a hard part. We don't have the two right. you know, experts on before we start going down some of these rabbit holes. Right? You know, it really comes down to it. I think the chart showed it. the lower incomes, where's the problems at? For sure it is. Mm -hmm. and those parents aren't going to come because number one is most of them are working two or three jobs right. just to put food on their table. Right. So they don't have the involvement to get into it. And the ones that don't need that are the ones that come. Yeah. So somehow the program's got to be addressed to help the lower income and the kids, directly to the kids, because the parents don't have time to get involved. And if you think you can offer them this and that, it doesn't matter because to them all they want to do is feed their kids. Maybe we should hire them. And so that becomes the problem. Maybe we should hire them. <laughs> Seriously, give them jobs. Yeah. Teach their kids. I mean, that might be cheaper. Yeah, right? that, that's the problem. That's not funny. That's, that's yeah. Yeah. Well, then you can also work into mentoring or some sort of surrogate or something. Eventually. And exactly. high school seniors. Later down. Yeah. People yeah. want to go in and take on a child. And yeah, they work, and on, help you work, work with the with kids them. and let the parents survive because that's yeah. how they're doing that. But like it or not, I don't know if you've embraced this reality in your life, but I invite you to do so. Uh, the, the current generation of 25 and under, the current generation of 15 and under, this is everything to them. I had a star quarterback. He's at Ole Miss now. I mean, he was good. Who, when I asked him one day, because I asked him to give me his phone because he was paying attention to anything but me, and he said, I'm not giving you my phone under any conditions. And I said, this day after class, when you to talk about that. Under what conditions would you give up your phone? And he said, I'd quit football before I'd give this up for 10 minutes. So whether you like it or not, this is very much their world. It is their best friend. It is the parent substitute. And you got to get used to it. We cannot resist that in the force that's necessary. So 
rather than books, are we moving toward applications? Because that's what their world is. Mm -hmm. It is. And we can tell them, no, no, this is Little House on the Prairie. You have to sit in a desk. You have to read the book. They're going to go, what the hell are you talking about? This is my world. And it is profoundly true. I actually just added today, thank you for inspiring me to my long list of apps that I want to build. An app that parents can install there that says, you don't get to watch your favorite sites until you've done some achievement in reading. And the app could keep track of that. That would at least say, in order to get what you think is your reward, you have to also do a little brain work. So that's been inspiring for me. This replaced the television for, for this generation. Yeah. Our kids, yes. my kids, the TV was the Absolutely. babysitter. Sitcoms. This is now the babysitter. It is. I had one, one of my um, son's classmates in high school talking about the TV and, and your idea. Their, um, their parents built a stationary bike with a generator. In front of the TV? In front of the TV. <laughs> and so the only way the kids could watch TV oh, was by pedaling the bike. <laughs> That's so awesome. those kids were pretty darn physically fit <laughs> while they were doing what they wanted to do, right. Right. which was watch TV. Good. All right, well, Kim, thank you so much for well, joining us today. Really appreciate uh, yeah. you coming on. Right, this this? and brochures. And okay, stuff. and uh, we'll make sure to get your presentation out uh, to everyone as well. If you can email that a copy of yep. that to us, okay. then I'll send it out to the full committee for the people that weren't here. They'll be able to see it as well. Okay, great. All right, thank, thank you, you very great. much. And you know, great to tag on to that. Um, and going back to a comment made earlier about it's too bad that, that Mike and, and Melissa weren't here. But um, could we, at, at one of our next meetings, um, have them spend a little bit of time talking sure. to us about the programs that they have as long as, as you set the stage? then it would be really good for us to know what's really going on. Yes, sir. Uh, I have thought about, uh, I have thought about in the next uh, two or three months, uh, the two of them just being our program, uh, because in addition, in addition to talking about these particular issues, I think it's kind of getting to be time for us to let them give us an update on just how they're dealing with COVID and all of the fine tuning and tweaking that they've been doing this year to try to make that work better. Uh, we haven't heard an update on that in a few months. And I, I think that would be good as well. So I, I talked into both of them recently and they're actually doing pretty well. They have not had any real outbreaks in the schools. Cases, right. There right. have been community outbreaks. So kids have been quarantined at home because of their their parents or their siblings getting infected, but no outbreaks in the schools. Right. Are there any programs, obviously COVID has impacted, but prior to COVID, what are our libraries doing for kids? What kind of programs are the libraries providing around here? Well, there's only one library and that's ours. I mean, so there's no library in Hot Springs? There is in Hot Springs, but these kids can't get that. Well, I, yeah, I understand that. We have so, some and does, does ours provide anything for? I mean, we have we have some basic summer reading type programs. We're not a research type library. I mean, we're a we're just not that. We don't have. It's that a skin community book club a, library, yeah. is what that is. Yeah, yeah it's not in your <laughs> traditional sense. Well, you know, I I look at some of things, but it's we have some like you say a a larger group of kids in this village that people think. Well what I can do we do we not have a, a Saturday morning that they do a some an event that you know a read a read a story, have a we do a villager summer. come in and read the story to the kids type thing. It's a good idea. We have programming in the summer but not so much in the in the I'll, I'll let you know that. Just well, the most community foundations are county oriented. They're, they're, you know, like Craighead County Community or Green County or right. Faulkner County. Um, we're the only one that's like a little bit of Garland County and there isn't one in Saline, so we cover Saline County as well. Um, but one of the other counties has done is partnered with the schools and given a grade level reading grant that was matched and some of the businesses pitched in to help. They used one of the school buses all summer long, and a couple of the teachers 
and they went, and it was a mobile library. And they took it around the whole county at least once a week and delivered books to the kids and had a story time on the bus and all that kind of thing. So we could do something like that. Probably. Well, I know that this last summer we spent a lot of time with our buses going out, dropping off lunches and meals. Yeah. Why couldn't we have used them to bus these kids in to a library where they spent an afternoon hearing stories and getting their lunch? Sherry, I really like what you're saying about hearing the story. You yes. hand them a book, it becomes a doorstop if they don't make that come alive. But to have the Rotary Club, right, Rotarians here, I'll, I'll volunteer right now. I'll do it once or twice a month to just bring the passion of reading yeah. to the children. We have tons and of make a story authors come here alive. in this village. And who better, you know, than an author to right. sit down and read and inspire these That's kids. a good idea, too. Well, and you have the players that love acting. Yes. Oh, exactly. They be great readers. So, yeah, there are all mm -hmm. kinds of groups that you can use. Mm -hmm. Don't you remember somebody reading to you about <laughs> something? <laughs> Huck Finn going down <laughs> something that made you want to get rich yep. with Oh, all the Oz books. Yeah. Oz 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 yes, books. Yes. that'd be great. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Cam. Appreciate thank you coming by. Well, I have a one quick second. I, I sit on the foundation board also. And um, we certainly need membership. But if you're not currently a member of the foundation board, your funds are, are certainly being used for good things like these programs. So we would encourage you to join. Right, Kim? <laughs> good job. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you for devoting this much time to the subject. I think it's, I think it's a great subject. It's a I, mean, I think it's something that uh, the village doesn't understand a lot of, right? Um, Second nature for us to read. Right. Yep. Um, all right, so we'll continue on with uh, kind of the, the general meeting now at this point. So any any additions or changes to the minutes from the last meeting? All right, seeing none. We'll, I, I noticed yeah. that Gary Troutman's name is not listed as a guest. From the minutes? Who? Uh, Gary? The guest speaker's name is not listed as a guest. Gary Troutman. Oh. It's listed, yeah, on the minutes it says... Guest speakers, Gary Troutman, President, Hot Springs Chamber of Commerce. Well, just in the, I guess, okay, I guess I was looking to just word down to agenda minutes and guests, and it lists all the people that were present as guests. Craig Hall and Jeff Lofgren. Oh, uh, okay. I don't, maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think since he was listed as on the minutes, I think that, those were the other people yeah. that came with him. Okay. Uh, I think we got everybody captured anyway. That's good that you're yeah. proofreading in that <laughs> <laughs> hey Bob, somebody read the minutes. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and mark those as approved, uh, as submitted. All right, so uh, we'll move on to any other updates. Uh, POA board, Pam. No updates. We're not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie, POA. <laughs> Are you being serious? <laughs> can, I, can I step in and ask one thing? Sure. What would what, what, the final outcome with respect to the economic impact study. The final outcome, and, and Stephanie and I talked about this in detail, and, and um, since we don't know when the census is coming out right now anyway, and it looks like there may be a delay, so that, and that is critical to the impact study. And because um, in, in the transition of people and positions, uh, it did not get into the 2020 budget. Oh, that's right, the 2021 budget. So I still, I know 2020 is almost over. Oh, thank God. Um, but uh, so we will make sure that it gets into the 2022 budget. And then um, hopefully that means that we can start working on it in 2020 and pay in 2022 and it's in the budget. So it's not going to start as soon as we hope. So I should call Wayne Miller and let him know that we're going to be on a delayed time frame. Yeah, we'd be looking at late 2021 to get started. Okay. And do you, does anybody know why? Because I, I keep hearing that the census results are, are, are not going to come out at, when expected, that there's a delay. Have you heard that, Keith? Yeah. Well, the last email I got since I was on that census group said, you know, they're coming out 
spring. They, yeah, they have to be certain. There's first a third date certain they're supposed to be yeah, certain. There's a right? date they have to come out with because they got to yeah. start the reapportionment right. the whole process because that has to be in place for the 2022 election. Right. So they can't wait too long. I mean, the email that they sent out from Chicago that I got and probably Kurt got and Jim Zahn got said, you know, there's a date. And I can't remember what it was, but it wasn't like it was going to be delayed that long. They're, they know they have to move forward. And because there's just so many other processes that have to go on. I mean, the state legislature needs that. Why is it delayed? Do there's a court case about whether or not, um, oh. about the, you know, immigrants, citizen, immigrants and, you know, whether or not they should be counted in the census. census. And so that's really the challenge right now, I think, that's out there. But I think that's going to be resolved in this supporting court session, which will be before the end of this year. So I, I, I would keep, I don't think it'll be delayed that long because I don't think they can delay it because it affects so many other downstream activities, including the upcoming elections in the next year or so. 2022, because you think about it, early, you know, people are going to start filing the end of 2021 for those early primary states mm -hmm. in 2022. Right. And, and it really gets interesting around here because, you know, this is a, you know, the off year election is big in the state for all the uh, state offices and county offices. Right. So they've got to have that stuff done. So. It now says that April 1 would be the very latest that the Census Bureau would send redistricting counts by state. Because it gets down into the, the hundred state house districts here in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And it's a bigger one that is is the four congressional districts. Because if you sure. look at how the four congressional districts are divvied up right now, it's an interesting, Bruce Westerman's fourth district is really an interesting district. You don't think there was some gerrymandering going on there? <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a lot of little, tiny little fingers of that. Exactly. Okay, so our official response from the board is we're going to delay that uh, with, the, with the state folks and we're going to tell them that we'll get back to them in the third quarter-ish. I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. Okay, third quarter. Okay. Unless they'll in. take an IOU. <laughs> <laughs> third quarter, that sounds okay. good. Okay. And, and the board has been busy. There's just nothing of particular note at this time that, that, that really... Well, one note is that you're open for people to apply to the board for this coming year started this week, right? True. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a few openings. Yeah, there are a few. Five. Or five. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a few. Yeah. That's a majority. <laughs> Greg. Yes, Greg, God. I would I would just urge that we not delay this too long. The this is a this is a project that when it's complete has significance for the village to a large I mean to a great degree uh, and our ability to be able to have these this information to communicate to the surrounding areas has in the past been significant and so I'm I'm disappointed that we're not going to be able to start it sooner uh, because I. From my past experience, uh, uh, this is a pro this is one of the most significant projects that this committee has brought forth to the board to the village. I agree, and we did express that to the board the last meeting when we found that it had been kind of falling through the cracks during the transition time. Mm. You know, as we started to as I because I just became aware of it early when my last meeting here, I guess. Um, and started digging into it. And my understanding is this committee actually does quite a bit of the work beyond what we're hiring out done. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it doesn't mean that we can't actively be working in 2021. We should be, this committee, I would say, should be doing the work that they can the, do. The problem is, Stephanie, the committee does a lot of work, but it's quarterbacked by Wayne Miller and his guys right. on the UALR. They're they the need ones to that actually them. provide us all the data. Yeah, they're yeah. the ones, what do you need? Okay, people provide the jury yurks, of the world who used to provide a lot of this data, you know, Wayne would be working with him, but Wayne is still in charge of it, right? Okay. So there's it is, really not much you can yeah, do without the data, which they need to go to. This is the point 
reference, we did get an estimate for the cost, and it was $22,000 for the new study. And that was about the same as the last study. Yeah, I think, so. the, I think the last study was 20000 523. Yeah, so, so it was pretty close. It, it was just unfortunate that that there were a number of moving parts, um, people that committed to getting it into the budget and then they weren't here to be involved in the budget process and so on. So um, it, it was one of those things and there, there wasn't much we could do by the time Everybody went, well, wait a minute, where are our champions? They're not here. Would it, be, would it be possible as a way to just get the ball rolling and get things uh, uh, started <clears throat> since we do have a since we do have a previous study? Uh, could we go ahead and uh, look at the previous study and look at uh, a lot of the stuff? That we might want to have again, but 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 just updated to be more recent, and go ahead and get with Wayne with at least that part, and start saying to him, could you could you go ahead and start just updating these particular data? That would be something. I think Wayne understands the study a whole heck of a lot better than we do, right? And he has all that data. He just the, the key to Wayne is he needs to have the commitment of dollars. It's like Andy, he's he's a you know, he works for UAR, but it's a business. They need to have the commitment right. of dollars before they can, you know. And I, I otherwise I just think they're giving us the data for free. They're not yeah. gonna do that. I mean it's, they understand it. Wayne understands this a lot better than any of us in this room understands it. Right. And it's that all right, yes, we commit, we sign the contract, boom, then they start doing it. What if they were willing to do a contract which didn't require payment until late term? Is that possible? Is it a payment problem or is it, no, I mean, would the board accept something like that or is it just a, you know, we're not going to commit anything until we get it in the budget? I can certainly run that up the flagpole. Pam, as important as this is to this community, $20,000 of a Thirty-seven or whatever our budget is. I know. This is. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you make a really good point. And I think part of the challenge is that the the general residents out there, and and even people on the board, um, and, and even people in the POA, don't really understand what the value of that impact study is and, and how important it, it is to the village as a whole and to its future and to its position out there in the surrounding community. So that, that's part of the challenge. It, it's just yeah, getting people to understand why this is so important. Well, I think one of the things that, and Keith brought a new item to the agenda today about you know the priorities for roads, right? And things with the county. What are the what are our priorities for Saline County? Uh, you know, part of us being able to get the items that we have as priorities done in Saline County is is based on our economic impact to Saline County, because and, and they ask us for that information. And Keith even quoted that from the last study in the the letter that he wrote, right? Because that's really what gets us clout. And if we don't have something specifically, I think something prepared by a third party that says, yes, this is truly the economic impact that Hot Springs Village has, we lose a lot of that clout because they're like, okay, well, how did you come up with these numbers, you know, or, or whatever, right? I mean, it's just kind of like, yeah, whatever, right? So having that study gives us the clout to get some of those things done that we want to get done, like getting things done with roads, getting things done, you know, with whatever, broadband. right? Broadband, you know, healthcare, whatever, that those economic impact numbers are the ammunition for us with state and local officials and even, you know, people like the hospitals and people, right? To, to go to them and say, hey, this is why it's important. We're contributing 
you know, $20 million into your economy, right? Well, so You're 100% right, right, Greg. Uh, you, you couldn't have stated it any better. Well, it's even more important just the county is the state. And the because state. I tell you what, until the state starts looking at us as a viable city, instead of just a vacation resort, it's going to be hard to stand and grow and get the state to take us seriously. And, you know, this thing goes way beyond, which I'll get into my sure. report on the whole thing. But the whole thing is, it comes down to it, that is vital because the state's not going to give us anything unless they get something back in return. Right. And unless we can sell them on the idea of what this is going to benefit the state, we can forget trying to get anything. And I think it, it goes beyond that too, right? We had a question that come, came to us this week about or what's our priority for COVID vaccines? Well, again, <laughs> you know, I mean, again, this is ammunition that gets us beyond what Sam said. It's like, oh, there's just a bunch of vacationers and, you know, whatever. And I should feel it's just not really impactful. Well, sure, this we is, have some kind yeah. of contingency funding. Greg, I, I would urge, Greg, that you, uh, you and Keith uh, arrange a meeting with uh, uh, our, our board president and the GM and to help to educate them on how important this is and perhaps find a way that this, this can get into this year's budget. That, that, that along with other questions, Bob, is what I got in my report yeah. Uh, yeah. that we need to do. But you're, yeah. you're right on. But there's more than just that. Uh, thing too. And Bob, that's a really good suggestion, and maybe to expand it, um, we, you know, the board has the discussion sessions um, and the information gathering sessions, and it might be a really great idea for you, Greg, you, Keith, and 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 you, Sam, because it seems as if you're gathering some information that would be relevant too. Um, co actually, come to one of those sessions sooner rather than later and, um, and, and present it to the board so that the board as a whole is, um, a, is behind you and is on board. board and it's an adjunct to that in terms of just talking about an amorphous document that's out there somewhere on the web. Make sure they have a copy of the report. We, we have hard together. copies. Don't, don't uh, you have some? A case of them. A case yeah. of them. <laughs> a case, a case of hard copies. <laughs> I, and we've had there have been two <laughs> reports that I'm aware of. This is the this will be the third one, I believe, that has been done here. And so I think having both of those uh, old copies uh, as a part of it, just to show that uh, this truly is a, a document that has uh, has done great service for the village, as you say, it's our ammunition for the future. So Pam, could you take that as an action item to get us on a discussion session? So we happen to have one coming up next Wednesday. That's an information session, and um, luckily those are informal enough that that we can add to the agenda pretty easily. So if that would work for you, I'll make a point of getting it on the agenda. Yeah. I think there's one thing that we're overlooking, though. We have a lot of new villagers here that aren't gonna understand what this is. How do we educate our villagers of uh, that there is an impact study and why it's so important? You know, we can talk about it and we kind of, I mean, I don't have a clue, but most of y'all do. But how do we educate the people that live here? Why do we have to spend this money and why it's so important? Yeah, I think one of the things that we can do with this next one is get it all online, right? And, and then we can then we can push it out to it's all online the right It is online. Yeah. But I mean, we could put it in like the newsletter. We could put it in that magazine thing we send out. I mean, we could do articles around the impact of Hot Springs Village, yeah. right? Um, you know, to the state, the local, county, whatever. Yeah. I don't, I've never seen an article like that, right? Well, it's ever been those articles right. to come out. When the study comes out, and I can tell you the last study when it came out in 2016, there were articles in the voice and everything else that talked right about that. It was, it was promoted, it was brought to the board to say, here's how you speak. Because it goes back to something I'm sure Stan will talk about is 
what are the speaking points that Hot Springs Village wants with the politician? You know, it's to, you can tell us exactly what your speaking point is so that Larry and I can take that forward to the county or take it to forward to the state. That's, you know. Okay, I think, well, we'll close this, this conversation. I think, Pam, if you can get us on this session, session, I'll commit to come and speak on behalf of the GAC. Keith, if you could come, that would be great as well. Stephanie, if you could get all the board members copies of the current impact study so they'll at least have seen something <laughs> to have an idea what it is we're talking about. Um, and, uh, I'll, send a, I'll send them up to the GAC website. Is, is it going to be at 10, 10 o'clock again, the discussion session? Isn't that what you guys decided? You're going uh, to at 10 o'clock? Nine. Nine o'clock in the morning? Yeah. They changed the time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, what I'll do yes. is get it on the agenda, and then um, I will send the link to the economic impact study, the 2016, that's on the GAC website in advance of that, because it'd be hard to get all of them copies before. I, I think so, if we could get we copies for them that have at the meeting hard yeah. copies. Yeah, we can do that, but let's get them something in advance. You can get something to them on the link, but I mean, physically yeah. have a lot of hard yeah. copies for them when we're there. I think. And I think, you're, and I think you're onto something really good because I think it would be impactful to right. see the hard copies. Right. To know what it is they're getting. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. And the depth of it. Can we do that? Right. Yeah. Okay. Do you think right. UA LR would be willing to take eleven lots in payment? <laughs> <laughs> We can they'd, a lot, they'd be able to get a lot more than 11 for $22,000. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they get them for 50 bucks a piece for the state. So. Right. Uh, <laughs> Since we're on this, can I just put my report? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Before. We'll let Sam go next. Okay. Uh, start off with the luncheon still up in the air. And I think it's probably on thin ice will probably fall in before it gets done this year. Uh, I was asked to send it out again from Ella, as you saw. And I got two replies today, one from Larry and another one. They preferred way after the holidays and after the year, which makes sense. And I think that's probably what happened. Anyway, I had a great lunch with uh, Luano and Kirk. And we went over, he discussed the history of the uh, GAC, which he was right there at the beginning. And he told me how he really worked close with the POA board. And one of the initial things was to work to gather information that the needs of the village were needed and then take it to the state or the uh, the county at that time and he sees they told me talked about the direction that he sees us going today which pretty much lines up to the direction i think we should take as far as and again i'm looking at my responsibility uh on the, on this committee i Going a little further, I read the medical and healthcare study of 2017. And it probably should be updated when the census comes out. But I'll be honest with you, it shows that you know primary care is maintaining, it's probably okay. And that the specialist, uh, for short, a specialist. Uh, and to be honest, I don't see that changing. I think we're just too close to facilities like hot springs, uh, Benton, and even Little Rock that has the facilities. Now, the only way that might change is if we expand the population and the needs of the community outside the gates, and we can justify uh, facilities with specialized equipment and everything else. But again, then we're bumping up to the other communities or the other larger cities. So I really don't see that as being feasible. I read the white pages. Uh, the medical directory that's in there, I think, is great, although I don't know why it's there, because my feeling is, to me, this is something that needs to get out to the community. And I hope this is available, easier access to some of the community, because no one's going to look at the GAC and look at the white page. It's also on the website. Okay, that's good. And I assume. I, I, couldn't find it. I couldn't figure out why I was hoping that was the case, because no one's going to read the white pages and just move in here. Will the plan share, share, share the plan? Can she share the plan yeah, sure. real quick? Yeah. To, get, to not just get it on the website, but. The hope is that this will be handed out as new villagers move in at time of closing, when they're closing on their home, give them either access to, to the link on the website 
or give them the physical copy or hopefully both so that they have it from day one when they get here um it was just recently updated i don't think the website's been updated yet but they're working on it uh yeah um, it was sent as it, it was will eventually may of 2020. right yeah it will eventually hopefully this time be also made credible so any of the villagers can print it off um i think we are starting getting to the point where they're going to include it in the newsletter occasionally like maybe once a month my suggestion so that it can remind people that it's there um, but other than that if it, it has been updated and we're just waiting for the it to to bring it back to, to the current day okay uh moving on uh the state government office I looked everywhere. I could not find you know, everyone's listed except our state representatives. I found that kind of strange because those are the ones we need to deal with right away. So I would think that needs to be added to it. They have the, uh, the, the national, the US, but in every other office except our state representatives. So that needs to be on. Legislation issues 2010 through 2012. That was nice reading, but that's just. We need to start putting in stuff that we need now and, and come up the current challenges. History of the GAC. It was interesting, the three stages. The first stage was really starting off working closely with the board, being their mouthpiece, being their lazy aunt and standard, and actually communicate the needs of the village to the state and, the, and to the county. Uh, after talking with Lou, and the Kirk on the whole thing, I think we need to get back to stage one because I think we've kind of drifted away from that, which kind of goes with what we're talking about, about today. Um, and that's working closely with the POA board and the GM. We need to find out the needs of the village that the state can help us with, as well as the county, and pass that on to the state reps. Better said, we need to be their mouthpiece. We need to be the in-between. That was the original purpose of the GAC, according to Luke. And I think, I don't know, just my own feeling, a few, and I'm short time here, but I think we've kind of drifted away from that. And we need to get back to that. That's it, POA board wants that. Uh, but that means being able to, but that also then means, besides finding out what we need to get for the village and, and working with them, we need to find, put it this way, but that means we have to be able to show the state that we can, that they can benefit by helping us. Because put it this way, they are not going to do anything if they think we're just a resort. We have to throw, tell, show them that we're a thriving city and can put money back into the state. Because that's all they care about when it comes down to it. Otherwise, they, that's nice, people come and visit, but you can't give me anything all, all year long. When we meet with the state, we need to bring back with us the latest data, those are the census, the population, the number of home owners, and the number of land owners, and the amount of taxes they pay every year back to the state. We need hard numbers that are based on that. We need to come up with sales tax income that our community generates both by the people who live here and our visitors. Again, tremendous income to the state. We need to show the state our growth projection, as well as the current growth projections that we've made over the past years. Again, if we're going to show them this is the money we're giving you now, but we can increase it, we've got to show them why we believe that as far as projections go. However, and here comes down the problem that I don't know if we have or not. To accomplish this requires that the POA board must believe in our ability to accomplish this and is willing to work with us. Then and only then can we move forward and work for them and more importantly, our community. Kurt and I need, and now we're expanding that, which I think is good, to sit down with the GM, the POA board, explain our mission and see if they are not only interested, but willing willing to work closely with us 
as was done when the GLC was first formed. And that's my feelings on the whole thing. Uh, I think those are excellent points, Sam. And, you know, there are third parties that can help us with that data. Um, you know, I don't know if I remember some like Arkansas Technology Business Development Group. You know, they will do all this research for us for free, and it doesn't cost anything for us to join them. They do a lot of research for me as a business, and they do it all for free. Like your sales tax information, they can give you all of that. They can tell you how much sales tax we're spending in this zip code, right? But you, they but can, you know they what, can I would say, tell you all those things. But, you I just would, go ask. but I would say, if I'm on the PLA board, I have the knowledge, or at least have to get the information on how many people, how much tax money is coming in, how much we generate on the whole thing. Otherwise, how can you govern and and it? And even know what's going on in your community unless you have that information. And to me, that's where I will, I like to tap that information and sit down because I assume they have it. Otherwise, how can they do assessment adjustments or anything so else? Saying, here's what's coming here's where this all fits in. It fits in directly to the economic impact study because a lot of that comes out of the economic impact study. And it also fits into the philosophical change that the POA board has had over the last few years. And that's Having been a previous board president, knowing how we used the GAC back in those days versus how the GAC has been used recently. And that's a philosophical discussion that needs to be had because there's a lot of talented people that have come and gone on the GAC that have done yeoman's work for this community. And it just, you hit on a lot of the issues that are out there. It's just it's a philosophical issue. That, and the POA board right now is, has, that's its own challenges. I'll be very honest with you. This is, they got more challenges than they know what to do with right now. And uh, that's that's a very kind of a sad thing. But this organization as a GAC could have been taking, keeping things going with the behind the scenes folks. And that's a challenge uh, that we just need to figure out. But we need to be chartered by the POA board to allow to do. That's what the GAC needs to be chartered to do some of these things. And it's, instead in, uh, in, uh, in lieu of the, the board members doing them because there's a lot of things you can do. doing. I think they just, they could task us with doing some of these things, right? So that's the way it was, right? That's Keith. why the GAC was founded. Right. Right. Keith, Keith, I well, think, uh, Keith, uh, uh, Keith I think in following up what you said, the Wednesday when you're gonna be with the board is the opportunity because the, the, the imp economic impact is, a probably the most significant thing that this committee has produced in its entire uh, history. Uh, we're about almost 20 years old, this committee is, and uh, that study, that, that, that really is critical and it's a part of what we are as a committee. And so I think you have that opportunity uh, that Sam is talking about to start that process on Wednesday as we push on this, on the importance of the economic study, getting the next one underway. Right. But I think it's also an opportunity if, if you're going to be there, the economic impact study is a perfect example to present to the board, but take it to the next level. Use the opportunity to say, this is what the GAC does. This is what we can do for you. These are some of the... Be specific. These are right. some of the tasks you can give us. Because if you think that they're going to sit there and kind of try and think up tasks, that, that won't happen, yeah. unfortunately. None, none of them, Pam, and the unfortunate part is none of the current board members, in lieu of you, only you, have had any experience with the GAC. And that's been a really challenge because previous boards used to have GAC alums on the board. And you're the first alum that's went back on the board for a while. Well, it, even beyond that, you know, when um, when I became GAC chair and, and we were brainstorming for last year what, what was going to be the initiatives, um, I went to the, to the board and, and the board chair and said, what do you need from the GAC? Don't know, nothing, don't know yeah. nothing. Yeah. And it's like, what can we do to help you? I don't know. 
And so that's kind of, you're right, that's what the boards, that's kind of the point that they've reached yeah. in, in general over the years and how they've strayed from what you're describing. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's an opportunity to bring it back around. But the, the, the challenge take work. that I have and we need to get back to is there are times when board members, the GAC folks came to them and said, you're going with me to this meeting. And we didn't, we didn't question why, but someone from the GAC knew this was an important meeting and we need to have the board president there or someone from the GAC there. But that's not, the board's not reaching back to the GAC today to do that. I mean, that's, that's the challenge. We, we've lost that, that connection there somehow. Well, it isn't part of that too though, the, the way the GAC has evolved so that uh, initially, the GAC members went went out to the various governing mm -hmm. individuals and governing groups and, and and set up relationships. But we brought a lot of those people here, like Larry Rainey, thank you for being mm -hmm. here. But so now they come to the meetings and we don't go out but anymore. There, there's still times when the GAC should be coming and saying, I, I yes. need you, Tucker. Yes to go to this thing, or you need to go sit in the office and just take a half an hour out of your life and go sit with this person, because this person will pay benefits down the road for the village. And that's the challenge that we've lost because the board hasn't accepted, well, I don't see, their, the, the board's understanding of the GAC, when the GAC says it's important enough to go spend 30 minutes in this person's office, it's probably important that as a board member, I know you're not getting paid and I didn't get paid, but there are times I was sitting in offices that talking to these folks and then the bigger part of that, Pam, was when the POA needed something, I could get on the phone and call that person and that person knew who Keith Kept was. The folks outside this village have no clue right now who's on the POA board and Charles is very limited to his exposure out there. Or if something catastrophic happens today, who's calling to get the help that we need? See, Pat, that's why I disagree with you. I still to them. It should be the board coming to us and saying, hey, we need some help in this area. Because we don't know. We're not there. We're not there. The board doesn't understand our community. Yeah, the board understands our community. Let's wrap up this discussion here. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think we'll take the opportunity on Wednesday at a discussion session to try to educate them a little bit about what we can help them do, right? And and try to maybe spur some of that thought process, right? About these are items we think you should think about and things that we could help you with, so that you board members don't have to go and do all of this stuff on your own or dispatch staff to go off and do them on your own, right? But we can help you research some of these issues like we've done with broadband, like we've done with healthcare, like we're trying to do with economic impact. All of these things we have done, you know, and people come to us and ask us questions that are of broader community statewide, you know, response. Like, when are we gonna get COVID vaccines? Okay, well, we can talk to the legislatures, we can talk to the state, we can try to understand more of that, right? Uh, and I think that, they just need to understand that we can be the arms and legs and you know, mouths and whatever to go out and try to reach out to these people to try to help you get those answers, right? So I think that would be an excellent. So thing we'll, we'll use that opportunity on Wednesday to do that. Uh, David, last, last comment. Just one sentence on this theme that we're having. Uh, I have already been trying to get as our January program someone from the POA. Uh, to be our January program and to basically give us a state of the POA message and the POA's agenda items for this next year so that we can begin to think about what are ways that we could help them with whatever their agenda items are. So I've already been trying to set that up as our January program. Are you looking at the POA board? Or I, said, POA I, said, I, said, I said someone from the POA and I'm going to be more specific. 
Well, I've already made a couple of contacts. And you got, you've got and Steph, you got Pam and Stephanie right here. <laughs> yeah. Right. There, there's your program right, right there. Well, and he sent me an email yesterday, and I, and I told him this morning, I'm happy to, happy to do whatever I need to do. I wanted, I definitely wanted to withdraw. If the, if, the two, if, the two of you would, if the two of you would like to do it, then we're set up. All right. Hey, welcome. Okay, <laughs> okay let's, let, let's move on. I think we understand that this is the issue. We'll try to do some education. The board, Pam, is going to commit to get us on the discussion agenda, and Keith and I will commit to going to attend that meeting. And, uh, and I believe Charles is in that meeting also. He usually comes right, to, usually. to those as well. He's usually a okay. part. So. Okay, good. It's a good opportunity. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Uh, broadband services. Um, Keith, you, had a, you talked to yeah. Aristotle. Yeah. Just a quick update from Aristotle. They continue to press on with trying to get the village uh, some state money, and so they can come in here. They have identified a, a fiber provider that they will work with, but their main effort right now is implementing the $2.9 million across the rest of Saline County because they got to have that in by 31 December. So they're they're humping right now. In fact, uh, from what I talked to them this week, they're starting construction in some areas of Saline County to start putting towers up and everything else. So they got less than a month to get all that network in. So their focus is still there in, with the village, but the village money would come next year type of stuff. Here. So that's where we stand. They haven't forgotten about us, but they got to get their butts moving on the money they have to be having the ground. Um, and as an alternative, uh, we're investigating myself, Dennis Simpson. We have had several conversations and are looking to put up a uh, test site uh, using the Citizens Broadband Radio Service, which was recently allocated by the SEC. It's a open spectrum, uh, 3.5 gig LTE uh, spectrum that's available. Um, it is a shared spectrum with the US Navy. We don't have any Navy installations in the Arkansas, so it's not a problem for us. Um, and we've already registered with what they call a spectrum access service provider, which basically allows you to coordinate spectrum usage. Um, and I've been in contact with some of my previous uh, companies I work with out of Taiwan. I think they're gonna provide us some equipment to set up a test site down and explore. Uh, we've done some initial propagation studies uh, using a new network analyzer tool that I have access to um, from Google, which will actually shows I can put the antennas on any location and it will show propagation studies. It'll show signal strengths across everywhere that I want to run it. Um, so I think that may be a viable option uh, for us here in the village, certainly as a fill-in option uh, for internet services. It would provide roughly 50 meg service uh, most of the time, there'll be certain areas of 20 meg. I mean, you can look at the propagations and understand what that would look like. Uh, but it operates using standard uh, LTE equipment. So hotspots, cell phones uh, would all operate on this service. It's all in the same vein. Um, so what kind of hardware is involved? Uh, it's, a, it's called a uh, CBRS base station. It's a fairly small, little compact base station. Um, and then what we're looking at at the restaurant is putting up a small tower mount at the side of the restaurant just as a test. We'll mount uh, some sectorized antennas on it, but like the ones like you see on cell towers, basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, connect it. We have broadband internet service. We get fiber at the restaurant, so it's no problem uh, for backhaul. We probably start with just using Sunlink cable. Uh, we already reached out to them for so, that. So altitude is still a factor. Altitude is a factor. It's a it's roughly 50 watt transmitter uh, for the shared spectrum service. Uh, so uh, you know, I think it's it's a good potential, and it's something that's easy to deploy, and it's relatively low cost. It's not something that costs a hundred thousand dollars a site or whatever to, to put up. So uh, so we're investigating that solution, and uh, you know we're doing technology calls with vendors. Um, I've got another technology call with another one today, which is could provide us the e node, which is basically the connection pack that does all the authentication and connects you to the cellular network and all that stuff. Um, but all that equipment, I mean, we're talking per site, probably less than five thousand dollars, so it's pretty inexpensive uh, to set up. So we're doing some investigation on that. As I said, this is kind of a new service. Uh, the licenses have just recently been granted. It's a, basically something that started in 2020. 
uh, with the FCC, even though the process of this started back in 2017. So there are also license spectrum in this space that carriers are using for private LTE for like stadiums, schools, you know, hospitals where they do private LTE, private cell phone networks, basically. Uh, they can do that. There's three categories of this spectrum. There's the private auction spectrum, which you pay money for. Um, you know, there's this shared access spectrum, which is coordinated through uh, what's called this SAS provider. And what it does is it says that if the Navy was to come over here and plunk something over here, the SAS would turn our frequencies or move our frequencies so they didn't interfere. And it's all done automatically. So there's no nothing you have to do to your phone or any equipment. It just kind of happens. So I think there's some good options there. Um, so we may want to look at some of the other, this is something that also might work well on some of the small towers that the POA has, uh, because it's small equipment, it's not a lot of power requirement. Some of it you can even operate on solar power, right? So might be you know, something that we could cover some of these areas. Uh, but I know that for example, from the restaurant, I can cover all of them as 50 meg from, from the restaurant. So, because I can see them basically on the restaurant. Can you get backside of Benefo? Uh, I'll get some service on the backside of Benefo, right? So, I mean, that's where you look at, when I run the network propagation studies, it actually will show me, I can put the tower here and I can put the point I want to look at, and it'll show me all the elevations in between me and that point. So, I can see where the low point's going to be, and it'll actually show me signal strength readings at any point Right. based on actual data from Google, right? So based on topography and terrain and everything else. And it even takes into account, you know, leaves and all that. The one nice thing about this service, not really affected by weather, has very little, there's, there's been studies done by many people that where they've done it in rain and snow and sleep, it's like your cell phone, it pretty much works with draining. It doesn't really get affected much when it rains. Um, there, it's mostly affected by you know, topography, uh, where you get backsides of hills and things like that. But those are things you can solve by putting another site on the other side, right? Aim them at each other effectively. So, so anyway, that's a solution that, you know, we're doing some investigation on, you know, more work to, to be done there, but could potentially be a good solution that the village itself could do at a relatively low cost. So, Chief, if we wrote a check to Aristotle today, so that they would start tomorrow, what would that amount be? What, what would it take to entice them to shift their resources toward this? The question comes down to how much the state will give her a spell. Well, what I'm saying is what would the check need to be if the state wasn't involved at all? You're talking in the millions of dollars. I can't give you an exact, it depends on what you want covered and stuff like that and how much coverage you want. So several million? It's into the millions of dollars to, to put all this. That's what they're trying to justify with the state to cover out the different areas that need coverage. It's the benefars of the world and yeah. stuff like right. that. The problem we have is you come down to Soto and there's good coverage right down to Soto. So you can't take them into account you got to take into account the people where you're going to provide the right. coverage to. So yeah, it's and future housing. Well, I think I look at return on investment return and how many people going to subscribe and all of that stuff, right? Yeah. So because it costs money to operate the service. There's, there's, well, at, at, at the Chamber of Commerce, this is a growing issue, probably no more or less than the POA's yeah. issue. That when people come walk through that door, hey, I've heard you guys don't have good coverage, mm -hmm. and that's an irreversible mindset. Mm -hmm. Once they get their mindset that this is a dead zone, not only will they not come, but the word will get out. And yep. but see, John, if we need to do a 10 year bond to do it, then I mean, this is a killer. Right. Uh, on the east side, what you need to have them talking about is if looking out there where we have all that potential for growth, mm -hmm. Aristotle can put their, the, the previous grant covers that area a oh, while wow. because it does not come in the village. So right down Highway 5 oh, wow. and Talking, you know, I put Aristotle in touch with with the folks that have facilities out there and said, get with these guys, and they're trying to work with Aristotle to see what they can get increased, like the health marks of the world yeah. and the tomorrow's therapy and whatever Brandon and Renaissance is going to do out there on the east side. They're not in the village. The money can go to that. Yeah. But as soon as it comes in the village, Aristotle can't they, they can't use it inside our gates right now. 
Thank you. Okay, so anyway, that's my update on the uh, on broadband and, and Keith's update as well. Um, we'll move on. Uh, Sam already gave his report. Keith, you want to talk a little bit about Saline County? The real, the big thing on Saline County is is the budget. Uh, we went through the budget. We're getting ready to do the approval in in, in December here. The challenge we had was, as I talked about previously. We had to bring our rate structure, our wage structure up to state, you know, kind of the, the median there. And then we got hit pretty good on healthcare because uh, the healthcare costs have meant high and our healthcare bill went really high. And we're, and the, the old timers on the board are talking, this is the closest we've come to, you know, we can only budget to 90% of our expected revenues. We're budgeting to 899 percent of expected revenue. Basically, we're, we're less, the, the last we saw, we're less than $100,000 of any contingency budgeting this year. We used to try to keep a half million to a million dollars that we don't budget. Uh, so Saline County's pretty tight. Again, it's, we had to up the, the pay raises or the pay grades there and then health care. So that's it. All, everything else on the county was kind of slowed down because it was focused on was the health care increase due to COVID or was it just another issue that came? Previous. It, it's previous to COVID. We have really taken a hit on the COVID numbers right now uh, in the uh, the government or the county employees. We, we've had county employees that have been um, affected, but it hasn't been to the cost. The, the, it was other uh, medical conditions which have really been expensive and okay, the, the caveat to that is is this a situation where employees didn't seek medical care because of the COVID issues with the hospitals and no, medical facilities these are previous conditions long-term previous long-term previous condition health that have been and again, it gets into the HIPAA thing. They can't go into to stuff that. Yeah. But it has. But in general, it has driven us to the point this year in Saline County that we were over 100 percent. You know, our previous and our insurer it cost them more to insure us than they were getting on the premiums. So what a shame. So guess what? They upped the premiums, and the, the bigger challenge was when we went out for competition no one competed yeah, right and so we're stuck with one competitor and we got to pay the price if we want insurance for our county employees which is a pretty important benefit to us. within that what kind of programs does the county provide to keep people healthy <clears throat> as 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 an employer, you know, many employers now. Yeah, there are some wellness aspects. I don't know the specifics, Sherry. I okay. mean, but yeah, there are some things trying to promote, you know, wellness and stuff like that. Um, and you can, you know, I mean, you can do that for 90% of the folks, and all it takes is 10% of the folks who don't participate. And guess what? There's Those are the big tickets. They're big ticket items. The reason I bring that up, I went to a a conference in Las Vegas a couple years ago, a few years ago, and their premise was that it's our responsibility as an individual to maintain our health. You know, and, and I kind of chuckled at the time and said, I understand you come from the left coast, you come from the east coast, where they eat fruits and nuts and exercise all day. I come from the Midwest and the Plains and the Ozarks, where you get out of the truck and you sit in your recliner and you say, honey, grab me a beer. That's a totally different mindset. Now, they didn't take kindly to my <laughs> descriptions, but it's a fact. This is a totally different way that people live here. And we have to find a way to, to bring a little bit of that to this area so that people begin to truly look at their health. And I would say, from the county perspective, we're trying to do it, but again, it's a it's a hard sell. It is a battle. Right. And for whatever it's worth, the human I was a human resources person for way too long. Um, there are informal movements in the world of human resources screenings for candidates. Mm -hmm. 
to work at a place to begin asking questions that are at the periphery. Mm -hmm. Like, tell me, tell me about your hobbies. Mm -hmm. And they begin to size up, is this a couch potato waiting for those pork rinds? Or is it someone who, and, 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 and to some degree, as long as they can stay inside that boundary, they're trying to pre-screen against health risk for the self-insured because that drives the, the race. As a former work comp nurse, that was a, a huge issue. Uh, the workers' comp, you can filter that for them. You can we, actually we ask. We did filter that quite frequently. And, and I would see, I didn't see so much out now fake injuries. What I saw in my practice was people who truly were injured. But if I didn't succeed in getting them back to work within six weeks, my ability to get them to return to work at all decreased by 50% within six weeks. Did you see that in six weeks? Sorry, okay. If you strike, uh, moving on. Uh, Larry, what's going on in Garland County? I had to get off a of mute there. Um, okay. it, a lot of what Keith said is kind of what we've been going through in Garland County. The last several uh, weeks have been budget stuff. We were uh, fortunate that we elected to cut back on a lot of expenses this year. So we had a, a pleasant surprise the other day to re report it back to us that uh, uh, we were well below where we thought we would be. So we're going to have some carryover. Um, we did basically just pass budget for next year is what we had for 2020. The only thing we did is um, we gave a, uh, a small increase to our salaried employees uh, across the board. It was a CPI index adjustment, but uh, basically it exceeded what CPI was at the, at the moment we did it. And the reason we did that was that two part, to adjust it, of course, and then the other thing was to play catch up because we are actually running behind in that regard. Um, the uh, next year, I think, is gonna be another critical year. We just have no feel for where it's gonna go. Depends a lot on what happens with COVID. And, uh, so we're just playing it safe and close to the chest is what it boils down to. Uh, on some other matters, though, as I listened to the meeting this morning, I believe Sam, Bob had some really good remarks, good observations, as did Keith. And I, I would point out that uh, uh, the village is always of interest to politicians when politicians are trying to get elected. <laughs> uh, when, but in between the elections, they, um, they, they tend to disappear and perhaps maybe uh, as, they, as they come before us in the future uh, asking for support, it's a good point to be just blunt with them and say, look, you know, it's, this is a two-way street. Um, you need us, we need you. And uh, we would like to know that you're going to be here um, listening to us and helping us out in our our quest whatever those quests may be at the time uh you know that you just don't disappear in between the election cycles um i think there's some good folks that are serving and and um i i i, I don't really have any personal criticisms of anyone it's just a matter of that's the nature of the beast i guess the other thing, and more importantly, what I want to say to all of you is I apologize for my absence over the last several months. It was a situation of health issues, uh, non-COVID related, but both my wife and I had some health issues that had to be addressed. And it was complicated by COVID because uh, during that unexpected area where they didn't know how, and think would, how things would go down, uh, it was difficult to get medical help and um, get doctor's appointments, get in to see a doctor. Um, but we've worked through all of that now, and I've been very busy with my duties, of course, on the quorum court, and I serve also as an officer in the Republican Party, and this is an, was an election cycle year, 
And so the last several months have been fairly busy, but of course that's beyond us now. So anyway, I look forward to getting more involved and back into the groove, if you will. And I, I, I will hopefully see you all in person next month. Other than I, re I don't have anything else to report. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have anything they'd like to report to the group? Stephanie. I just have a couple things. Um, just some positive notes that I wanted to share with you. We had a, uh, we were featured on the front page of the um, Arkansas Business Magazine this last week. Free advertising. We did not pay for that. It was a nice free page spread in the insert as well. So you get a chance to take a look at that. A lot about our 50th anniversary and the history of the village and just kind of, uh, it, it's not a good article. So that's one thing. Um, I did want to just uh, touch for a moment on how good the housing market is going right now. I think everybody probably knows that, but we um, have uh, issued 79 new home permits through uh, this month or through actually through the end of November, which is up 10 from last year total. We have 15 additional new home permit applications sitting in my office right this minute waiting on approval. So that'll get us up in the 90 plus range for the year, which is Phenomenal for us. That's really, really good. We, we, like I said, we had 59 total new home, home permits in 2019. So that's that's big. So that gives us a, a, a feeling of momentum when we're happy about that. We do have several developers that are working with us right now on um, POA lot purchases. Um, Jay Allen Homes is, is in the process of buying uh, 15 lots from us right now for a development project that he is doing, and a couple others are coming around that we've not even seen before. So that's kind of exciting news to people coming in and investing. And then um, with Cooper's recent um, sell-off of their reserved property, we have several commercial projects that are in the developing stages, uh, planning stages. So you'll see, I think, in 2021, some, uh, some interesting things happening there as well. So just thought I'd mention all of those things. And uh, that's really it. Well, one more thing. Let me let me say something positive about golf. In, in uh, November of this year, golf did 22,000 plus rounds of golf, which is almost double what they did last year, same time period. Um, while we continue to to not be meeting quite the revenue numbers, don't forget that we had COVID as as an impact in the guest rounds, uh, which really makes a huge huge difference in our per uh, our average per round number. So golf rounds are are largely trending up significantly, but our visitor round was, was down and that's, that's a big hit because it's the higher, higher paying round. So that's a nice. Golf was pretty good. Thanks, Stephanie. Anybody else? We had a few uh, new business items. Uh, I had one that was brought to my attention uh, this week and maybe this is something Larry you might be able to help me with. Uh, there's been some uh, community asked about the traffic lights at the West Gate and how it seems to be getting short cycled on the village side. Um, and we're getting long lines of traffic all the way back to the gatehouse now, basically, on a pretty consistent basis where you have to sit through at least two lights to get through uh, onto Highway 7. Is that something that the county controls or is that an RDOT? Is that related to the construction? Can you help us understand or find out what that might be? I had to take it off of mute. Um, yeah. Yeah, in answer to your question real, real quick is I don't know. But having heard your remark, I will make some calls, find out. I don't really know who controls that light and, and who sets those cycles. But um, that's something we can certainly discover. Okay, I, I appreciate that. We've had, like I said, we had some uh, comments about that from various village residents. It's something I observe too. I mean, well, I go out that way. He goes that way all the time. I live there. Yeah. And that's where my office is. Right. And so we witness it. It is not an isolated issue. No. It has been an issue in terms of traffic, which is great. We're getting people up seven. But since they have changed the lights, the mechanisms, the timing does seem different than it was. And it is creating not only backups, but dangerous backups. People don't know how to clear an intersection, and so they create gridlock. We had a fatality of the motorcycle accident there last week 
right? And somebody was turning left and they shouldn't have, and the motorcycle went over the top of it and ended up in a coffin. And it is becoming an issue. Uh, I, I see it every single day. They are lined up back to the guard shed very quickly. So Larry, anything you can come up with or find out for us on that would be very helpful. We'll report that back. You know, my neighbor so. works for RDOT, and, and it, it, it won't help a lot, but I'll just ask him, is sure. it RDOT that controls those lights? And then that'll give us I think the most recent point. traffic counts are pretty old, because I've seen them. And if they don't do the counts, then they won't come out and change the cycles. Well, I'll see what he knows. Yeah, and, or and, what and he the whole knows. issue on it is RDOT puts in the light. Who actually maintains the light is a question. Yeah. Because I know if RDOT <clears throat> put a light in, so we want to know who gave, controls it. Yeah, who okay. actually who controls it? the lights? Yeah, because okay. RDOT puts them in because right. it's on a state highway. Okay, but is it the county or RDOT who's actually recycling? Okay, yeah. and it may be something that just got screwed up because of construction. I don't know. Well, they've been working on. There's been probably some people there working on that line pretty consistently the box. for yes. for some time, and I think part of that has to do with all that construction that's right. going on right there. Well, I think if we can find out who's responsible, then we can, you know, potentially reach directly out to them. I will. Larry and Pam, anyone that can find that out would be awesome. Greg, I will make some inquiries and give you a call. Thank you very much. Uh, Keith had a new business as well about uh, road priorities. Yeah, what I sent to Pam and to Greg was a letter that I would recommend that the POA chairman and the GM sign to the county judge ask they're setting the priorities for what they want Saline County uh, politicians and elected officials to promote as far as highways and roads. And it's a two-phase type of letter. It's the first letter that has to do with county, which is county roads and certain county roads that, that the POA wants the county to improve. Uh, in the letter, I talk about very specifically, we pay $675,000 a year to the county road fund. And I know that because I, I dumped, I had the collector dump the tax records for me, and I calculated how much we paid in 2019 into the Saline County Road Fund. So we are paying into that. You know, there's a millage on all the property in, in Saline County that gets paid into the county road fund. The also fact, fact that I put in there is that for the issue one that was just voted on, the village voted, and this is thanks to Jerry Yurk, who still does all this stuff, 65% of the voters in the village voted for the initiative. So guess what? Again, the village has come through and provided the politicians what they wanted. On something that was a pretty close vote. Actually. Which was on a <laughs> close vote across the state. When you look out outside the village in Saline County, it was only a 55-45 vote. The village came through at 65% in, in the counties, uh, in, in Saline and Garland County. But what I'm asking for the government affairs is to take this letter to the board and recommend that this be sent because that sets the priorities for Keith Keck, for Jeff Berry, and when it comes to county roads that the village wants, as well as it gives Keith Keck and Jeff Airy ability to go to our docs and say, this is what we want help with. And specifically in Saline County, it's Highway 5. Uh, there's some other things, you know, we're, we're moving forward with some improvements on Highway 5, but there are a lot of other things on Highway 5 that are potentially gonna be needed there in the next few years. But this would be the same type of letter that I'd recommend that Larry could really help with for Larry and Nub Hunter to take and give the Daryl Mahoney so that Garland County knows what is important to the Hot Springs Village POA. So you basically created this letter. I created that letter that, that I you sent. Have to put it on letterhead. You better look at it, make sure it has, you know, do the Ella look on it, but it's from the Government Affairs Committee, because this is what, when you go back to what Sam talked about, is what the Government Affairs Committee could be doing for the POA board to get to the yeah, politicians. And it was sent to the board um, and we didn't get a response. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, but I, what I'm trying to do, I don't want to be saying that, but I'm trying to kick step, start the process. No, it's a GM. Yeah, it's, it's sent. It was, it was sent to the board. Originally, it was sent. Yeah. So, 
But now I brought it back to the, the yeah. See, I and and I don't read it. Unless you sent it specifically to Tucker, if you sent it to the board, I don't remember. I sent it to Tucker. I sent the, the initial one went to Tucker and to Charles. Okay. Saying, hey, there's a road out okay. there, and it's, right. it's you know, okay. it, do you want us to focus? Do you want Keith to go and focus on this road with Jeff Berry because it's going to take some twisting of arms? But that's when we're pumping all this money into the county road funds. We should be getting roads fixed that we as villagers feel are important. And I'll give credit to, to Larry and Larry Griffin. If you think about five years ago, what Danville Road used to be like with the one lane bridges, that was something that the, the, the POA said was important. We need to get Danville Road kind of fixed. And so at the previous judge, Rick Davis said, hey, yes, I know there's money. How can I help the village, but I can't come inside the village. So they fixed those bridges and they built those nice bridges. So now when you go on Dan Road, you have to stop and go over, wait for the one lane clearing to go over the Ricky Old Bridges, which when it rained, we're about ready to wash them. But that's what I'm trying to ask the POA to do that. I know what, the, you know, kind of some of the priorities are, but in that. And that's the same thing that I've went taking out to the public in the social media and asked them, which roads do you think are important, county roads out there? Because I want to be representative of the POA and I want to be representative of my constituents. I can't speak for Stephanie, but I'll take responsibility to get it to Tucker and to get his signature. Yeah, but I get Charles, I mean, it's one of those to get the type of stuff there, but look at the letter. Make changes. Would you send it to us? Sure, I'll resend it. Yeah. Please, that'd be great. Type of stuff there. But Keith, if your letter includes specific roads. Oh yes. yes. It, it has specific roads that you want us to focus on, both county and state. Because the state one is important for everybody because the local politicians then go, when they're meeting with RDOT, are trying to poke them to say, hey, yeah, this is important to us. It's like, you know, in Garland County right now, a lot of this poking was done previously on Highway 7. And that's why you're seeing construction going on outside the West Gate because four or five years ago, the poking went on. It takes time. It takes time, but it, the poking is important because when you start looking at long-term plans, you got to get it in the plan to get right. this type of stuff. So it may not be instantaneous, but if we can get it in the plan, that's what I'm trying to generate and to start that relationship a little bit with Sam is because this was something that would have come out of a white paper, you know, 2010, 2012, that got Highway 5 resurfaced and got shoulders on. That was basically came out of us in the GAC poking and then taking it. So Jim Zahn at that time could go gnaw on Lanny Flight at that time to get this taken care of. So, I mean, I'm just trying to help us reestablish yeah. some gap. Yeah. I'm sorry. Again, I think perfect. another thing we can talk about on Wednesday is just help them understand. Help them understand. Or, but this it. gives you a, here's my, I wrote the letter for you right. guys. Right. Type of stuff. Yeah. And it does affect you, Larry, so stand by. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you could get the letter over. I think that. he sent a copy to you as well, Pam. He sent to me and you. You should have it as well. Again. I'll look right now. Pam. I'll resend it. We know where our emails go, Keith. <laughs> For whatever it's worth, the agenda of this organization trying to educate the board might reach a little further than the discussion. Maybe to plant seeds around the impact study and then invite those board members to a special session of this group. You may be overloading your welcome because it's open to the public and there might be 50 other issues and they're gonna give you four minutes. So think about how you would want to prioritize what you no, want to say. Luckily, this is a discussion way. session not, and people yeah, get up and talk for half an hour, so. Right. Yeah, it's not, not quite as, okay. it's not quite as rigorous as it, but it's a good idea. And I'll, I'll invite them anyway. It's part of the so. so. uh, Okay. Um, Sherry, you did a little bit of research on the COVID thing. We yes, had some I questions did. about that. Um, 
we have had quite a bit of interest in the vaccines coming out and how it will affect. Well, we have a station, say, set up here in the village where villagers can go and get their vac vaccinations. Um, right now, the last that I heard on Monday is there is a possibility the vaccines will be released or approved by FDA as soon as the 15th. Um, my understanding is distribution is set up to begin within 24 hours after approval. The state of Arkansas is going to be receiving approximately 45,000 vaccinations. Which is 22,000 people. This right. Super... The, the problem will be that's going to be given immediately to all of the healthcare workers, uh, the police department employees um, in this first phase. There won't be enough vaccinations to even cover all of them statewide. It's looking like to get it to the village level will probably be, they're, they're saying early to mid-summer. I'm kind of guessing closer to mid to late summer before it actually gets to our level because it's going to have to go through all the first responders, all the nursing homes, um, and then the nursing home residents, those who have chronic illnesses that are, you know, are at higher risk. I don't think there will be stations set up inside the village. At this time, it's looking like this will be delivered through the hospitals, your medical providers, and your pharmacy. And villages will have to adapt and go to one of those entities, unless something drastically changes in their plans for distribution. Yeah, I think I've seen the same numbers, and I think that based on the the guidance just came out from the CDC, the first wave, phase 1A, I guess it's called, um, is residents of long-term care facilities um, and healthcare workers. Um, and basically 22,000 of those is like a point of a percent, even in Arkansas, it's a really small number. So uh, I think that before we see kind of general availability, it's gonna depend on how they categorize all these different phases, whether you're an essential worker, you know, all the risk categories, all of these things are gonna come out of the CDC probably over the course of the next month. They're gonna tell us what all the phases are. Uh, but Arkansas is only gonna get, between now and like the end of January, less than 100,000 doses, which is 50,000 people between now and the end of January effectively. Uh, so, you know, we're not gonna see a general vaccine program you know, for the general population, I think anytime soon. And I think the worry there's, I saw some, some articles this week, there are some side effects to a substantial number of people that takes this vaccine, especially on the second shot where they have fevers and chill, things like that. And there's a lot of worry in the healthcare community that those people, when they take the vaccine, they'll have to be out of work and we don't have enough healthcare workers as it is. So they're trying to figure out how they can stage them to take them on right before their days off shifts. And it's a very big logistical issue that's going on. So. My understanding um, from one of the infection control nurses in White County is that it'll be delivered to their facility at the hospital. They will determine once their staff is taken care of, whether they have enough to then send it out to medical staff or medical offices. Right. Right. They may not have even enough yeah. to do that. So it's gonna be long-term. The last I saw on Monday, even firefighters will be in the second or third way. That's correct. So looking at just individuals here, they're not gonna see it till the middle or end of summer. And of course, there's concern to be a lot of people who don't want to take the vaccine as well. And so Why? I even saw something yesterday where maybe the government is going to give you your, if they do an extension of this CARES Act, that they're actually, if you want your check, you have to have the vaccine. Correct. The, the one check, thing that, that is a concern a right now with the vaccine <laughs> is that we are seeing, even here in Arkansas, people who are getting COVID a second time. 
So that tells me that they're not building the immunity mm -hmm. we had expected. And if that's the case, is the vaccine going to build that immunity? Right. Uh, and I don't have, you know, it may be that they have covered that in their research. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the data yet. Right. Any talk of the black market, this sounds so right for black market. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there was an article today in the Wall Street Journal on the black market. It's very right <laughs> for a lot of fraud and spam. <laughs> um, it's government yeah. workers holding a freezer door closed. <laughs> yeah. Right. All right. Thank you, Sherry. And I, we'll just keep track of that. I mean, again, yeah. I think that's another thing, you know, the GAC can reach out and try to help people understand, you know. I've been contracting saline and Garland health departments about twice a month just to see where we are. Yeah. And, and just a little further, Sherry. Mm -hmm. The little tidbit is that the health departments, at least in Saline County, are overwhelmed. Yes. And so they're trying to pass the dollar to other people within the county government right now. So that's a bigger challenge you have is that they're overwhelmed in what they're doing and trying to figure out who might manage this within Saline County mm -hmm. because it comes down to the county. And it's the same situation, Garland. Yeah. Right? They're, they're overwhelmed just even trying to figure out how to continue the testing and the, you know, the one good thing that I that I'm seeing is while the numbers of infected are going up, the number of deaths are not, and that to me is very encouraging. And yeah, we're definitely getting better at treating people that have the disease. That's for sure. Uh, any other new business? We're kind of close to the top of the hour here. Um, I do have a couple of. Uh, New uh, member applications that we're probably going to review this month uh, um, as well. We've got uh, one which we spoke to before, we're still interested, um, and have one new application as well that we received uh, over the course of the last month or so. Uh, so we're reaching out to them and, and speaking to them about potentially what they might be able to help us with here at uh, the Governor Affairs Committee. Uh, our next meeting will not be on January 1st, will not be on New Year's Day, it will be on January the 8th. <laughs> the following Friday uh, uh, 2021, the year of recovery. <laughs> That's what I'm calling it. <laughs> uh, so mark that on your calendar for January 8th at 9 a.m. We'll continue to do the in-person and the Zoom meetings until further notice, uh, just for people so they'll they can do whichever they would like to do. February to uh, first. February we go back to the first first Friday again, whatever that is, February. Uh, we'll go back to that same, the regular schedule at that point. So, all right, with uh, that said, if there's not any other comments, uh, I'll go ahead and call for adjournment. I don't know if it's of interest, uh, but, but I am serving on the Hospitals Metro Partnership uh, as a board member, and I'm also serving on the 50% teacher group. That helps. Yeah. That yeah, definitely. And I think if you, any updates you can give us on those as you attend those meetings would be great. But we still don't forget about, we need someone on the tri We still need someone on tri lakes. Mr. Carroll, I've planning organization. Right. That replaces, well, it's supposed to be a board member. Right. So one of them is supposed to be a board member, fam. Right. And the other one's still to replace David Whitlow. And he was always the... Uh, so you need two people. You need a well, board member and you need a David Whitlow replacement, is that well, correct? Really, if the board member is going to go all the time, then you don't need a David Whitlow. But the problem was David Whitlow was going because the board members want to go. But he can't vote. The board member, if it's POA board member, they can vote. Yeah, David, I, think, I think the board member that was covering that is no longer on board. Yes. Okay. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Uh, we will see you next year. Everybody have a great holiday and uh, stay safe.